might have permission, but nope, oh, there it goes. All right, mm -hmm. never mind. Yep. Okay, so um, like I said, I'll just start initially talking about what is STAR. So it's a research training um, program that's aimed to recruit, train, and retain outstanding, outstanding physician investigators. Um, what that really means is you're going to be able to get funded for some dedicated time in residency uh, for a mentored research experience. And what that would look like is 80% um, of your time would be research, and that's funded by the NIH. And then 20% of your time would be clinical. Um, and currently, at least right now, it looks like that 20% is going to be your continuity clinic. And that's funded by your residency program. So, um, you know, what this grant or program is, is basically an R38. It's an NIH institutional grant. So it's given to the University of Colorado um, and it's only awarded to, um, you know, a handful or a few more um, top training programs really focused on research. Um, we're one of like fewer than 10 programs in the nation. Um, a couple of the other programs include, you know, Mayo Clinic, Mass Gen, UCLA, Univers University of Pittsburgh, um, you know, just to name a few. Um, and like Dr. Schwartz mentioned, we just went to a um, virtual conference with um, all these principal, principal investigators from these institutions and they shared what their experiences with STAR was at their own institution and that was really um, beneficial to sit in on. Um, the University of Colorado STAR is programmed by the, uh, is funded by the NHLBI, which is a National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the NIH, you know, has, as an overarching um, organization, has several institutes under it. So that including the NHLBI, um, other ones including, you know, NIA, which is National Institutes on Aging, um, NCI, National um, Cancer Institute, um, NIAID, which is the National um, Institute on uh, Allergy and Immunology. So the, the fact that the University of Colorado STAR is funded by the NHLBI means that um, the projects that the, the R STAR program is going to be focused on funding are gonna be projects in cardiology, pulmonology, blood, which includes like hematology, immunology. Um, and, you know, Dr. Schwartz is um, one of the PIs, um, and then along with uh, Dr. Stephen Admin and Peter Betrick. So, let me see, okay. So who can participate in STAR, or a better question is who should participate in STAR? Um, residents who are interested in having at least a year and potentially two years of dedicated research time during residency. Um, residents who are starting their either R2 or R3 year coming this July, if you're in medicine or peds, and then if you're in med peds, you're starting your R3 or R4 year. And um, Dr. Schwartz and um, Dr. Connors can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's potential to for um, R3s who are looking to kind of extend their um, training, you know, want some dedicated research time um, as a research, uh, resident investigator. Um, so I think you, you would be eligible for that as well. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. We're going to make it as flexible as possible. Okay, great. So, you know, a big question is why even consider a career in research? Um, you know, being a physician is, an, is already demanding uh, and challenging as it is. And so why add on this, um, you know, whole other career of research and then why STAR in particular? And so, um, you know, as we know as busy residents, the opportunities to perform in depth and emphasis on productive research during residency is extremely difficult. Um, it's limited by time. And I think also mental bandwidth. You know, um, for, you know, the medicine program, we have our X, Y um, schedule. And with our Y months, we have a little bit of breathing room to be able to conduct research. But we're also, you know, in that month recovering from a busy inpatient month, wanting to spend time with family and friends. And so, you know, also having to focus on research during that time um, can kind of, um, you know, spread you a little bit thin as well. 
um, you know, a career as a physician scientist can be incredibly rewarding and flexible. And I don't think as residents, we have a lot of exposure to how rewarding that career can be during residency because we're so busy. And um, just as a firsthand, you know, working with my mentors who are physician scientists, I can tell you that it is incredibly rewarding um, to come up with a clinical question that you see from your own patients and then be able to direct your research and your projects to answer that clinical question. Um, and then additionally, it's I think much more flexible. You know, um, it is very um, challenging with some of the deadlines that come up, but you know, you work very hard. But I know uh, for a fact that there's a lot more flexibility in um, you know organizing your schedule. Um, I know a lot of my um, my both my mentors um, have said that when they come back into their clinical time after spending some dedicated research time. They're much more kind of um, revitalized to work with patients. Um, you know, there's a lot less um, uh, kind of burnout um, with clinical work. So I think it, it can be incredibly rewarding. And the only way to see that is just spend some um, good quality time um, seeing what that type of career is. Um, also, you'd be incredibly competitive for a lot of these um, fellowships. Uh, like we said, there's only a handful of programs in the nation um, that have this STAR programming um, that'll really stand out in your applications to fellowship. Um, you have opportunities to network with these principal investigators from these other institutions. And then also um, you have kind of um, a shoe in for additional funding from the NIH. Um, with a K38. And I'll talk a little bit about this alphabet soup of like NIH funding, which I know for a lot of people is very um, confusing because that was for me. Um, and why kind of coming with your own funding um, to fellowships will be actually um, really attractive as an applicant. And so I'm just going to show you this um, figure here that shows you how an R38 is very different from the traditional training pathway um, that you would um, have as a physician scientist. So um, kind of in residency, you can see, you know, most of your time is clinical. You have very limited time for research. In fellowship, um, you will have, you know, usually the fellowships are kind of clinical heavy in the first couple years and then later on um, have more dedicated time for research. I know that the, you know, pulmonary, pulmonary pulm program or fellowship here um, is that way where, you know, that your first year is very um, kind of clinic duty focused and then your second and third year and a potential fourth year um, have a lot more um, dedicated research time. And then after fellowship, um, you know, there's this uh, transition into junior faculty where you have a little bit more research time. And then um, as you become faculty um, and go on to um, achieve, you know, kind of those bigger grants and funding um, through your first R, you're able to do both clinical and research. And so this just shows you how the R38 kind of expedites that and kind of really integrates it into um, more of your residency training where you're, you're going to have some dedicated research time and be able to do both clinical and research um, and be more prepared for fellowships that are structured that way as well. Um, so this can be very confusing, but I just want to give you an idea of what this, you know, funding alphabet bet soup might look like um, as a physician scientist, because I know it was something that was really kind of foreign to me um, when I was considering a career um, in research. And so, you know, basically in residency, you don't typically have, you know, dedicated time that's funded to do research, and that's where the R38 comes in. Usually in fellowship, um, depending on the type of fellowship that you go into, um, whether or not that program is um, re very research focused, um, you'll have, you know, kind of your later years with dedicated research time that's funded by, by something like a T32. And that is, you know, per institution. And so, you know, the question is, you know, how, um, how come, or basically, 
as a you know R38 scholar, you are given an opportunity to get additional funding through a K38, which is kind of an, an additional grant. And you can carry that with you into fellowship. Um, and the benefit of doing that is as a kind of applicant to these fellowships, you can say, I come with my own K38 funding. Um, you know, I know that you have your T32 kind of funding for your fellows, but um, you know, I come with my own funding, which also comes with like additional support for travel, for um, you know, research specific um, expenses, and I think that um, will actually make you be um, very attractive as an applicant because. Um, you're going to be saving these programs money and then um, your first k usually comes in kind of you know usually after fellowship as you transition into junior faculty and that's kind of a stepping stone then to um, an r which is like you know full-on um, independent investigator so, so that's just an overview you go ahead i wanted to make a, a, uh, another point on this slide i I, I've run several fellowship training programs, um, and we're not that interested in saving money, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> what we're interested in is making sure that our track record of trainees moving into research is the absolute best track record that we could possibly have. Because when you compete for T32s, you're, you have to go back and say how many of your T32 trainees or even how many of your fellowship trainees are still doing academic work or still doing research have gotten grant support of their own. If we come across a, someone who has, who was supported by an R38 and now has a K38, they become a much more um, likely individual to move um, through the funding process and be successful in getting these next awards, the K awards or the, or the R awards. So it, it's really a matter of um, ensuring that we're betting on supporting people in the fellowship program that have the best opportunity to succeed in research. And it, it's sort of, it you know that proven track record becomes very very reassuring and important in terms of selecting the candidates so you become a, a top candidate overnight by participating in an r38 moving it to a k38 and applying for a fellowship at that point okay great and, and thank you for that input yeah quick question um so I, this is going to fully show how naive I am with all of this grant, the, the whole spectrum, but if the STAR program is relatively new, was the R38 a thing before that? And if so, was the K38, like, will fellowships kind of recognize what the K38 means pretty easily? It'll be like the best of the best. Um, so, no, I'm, I, I, and I actually really mean that. What Jay said is that there are very few programs around the country that have R38 programs. Um, and um, I worked like heck to get our R38 program funded by NHLBI. Um, and I actually have the, the largest T32 program supported by NHLBI also. But it took me uh, two tries to get the R38 uh, funded uh, program here. So we're one of a small group of individuals. And I can tell you that when you apply for a pulmonary cardiology hematology fellowship, you'll be recognized immediately as one of the few scholars who has an R38. And hopefully, uh, as part of your R38 training, you'll have one or two publications also. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that helps, yeah. As part of your R38 training, it will be training to apply for a T3, for K38. Okay, great. Um, so, and then, yeah, let us know again. It, a lot of this can be very confusing. I was very confused when I first, um, you know, was introduced to this program, but 
um, like Dr. Schwartz mentioned. And I think it was made, you know, very clear when we did our, um, uh, the kind of annual R38 um, conference that we did um, that it does make you stand out as an applicant um, to fellowships. Okay, um, other things that the STAR program can provide, um, I'll be participating in the bi-monthly meetings with the um, Physician Scientist Training Program, the MD-PhDs. Um, with Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Connors, and it gives um, us an opportunity to kind of um, talk with each other, other kind of, you know, physician scientists um, doing research, um, career development um, topics, um, and, and that sort of thing. You pick a mentorship committee um, that consists of um, MDs, PhDs, MD, PhDs that will not only help you with your um, research project, but with, with also like career development and career planning. Um, you know, you'll have opportunities and I think this is um, also um, very reliant on, you know, your mentor on um, training and grant writing, scientific writing, manuscript preparation, opportunities for journal clubs. Um, Data analysis, analysis support, I'll be working um, with a biostatistician um, closely to look at my data, um, you know, to help me out with uh, the skills that I lack in um, biostatistics. And then um, other opportunities for like seminars, webinars, and other short courses, whether it be through the CC STI or um, kind of coordinated with your mentor, you know, depending on your project, um, really sitting down and determining, you know, um, which um, short courses or webinar webinars are going to be mo most useful for you for your project. Um, again, opportunities for formal coursework, um, for example, you know, um, uh, uh, courses offered through the graduate schools. Um, for specific topics um, that I'll be doing in either immunology or biostatistics. And then additionally, you know, funding for um, your research itself. Um, I know for um, my project, a lot of it is funded through the grants of my um, mentors, um, but any, you know, additional funding that you may need for your project can be supported um, through the STAR program. Also funding for, you know, you going to conferences, um, if those start kind of um, happening in person again, and, you know, again, formal coursework um, and other workshops. Some financial benefits that I think, um, you know, should be uh, highlighted are, um, the opportunity to participate in an NIH loan repayment program. So, you know, I think a big concern for some people are um, the opportunity costs to extend your training, um, you know, missing out on another year or two of attending salary if you're going to be extending your training during residency. And um, I don't think well known is this um, uh, loan repayment program through the NIH, which is actually an opportunity for the NIH to pay up to $50,000 $50, a year um, in your medical school debts um, during your LRP reward or award. So what that means is um, basically you apply and um, the uh, requirements of the award is that you spend at least half of your time towards qualified research um, during your award. And so, um, you know, what uh, that timing might look like is potentially maybe in fellowship, um, you know, if you're in one of those um, research focused fellowship programs where you are spending greater than half your time doing research, um, you could potentially be getting, you know, up to $50,000 um, paid back in your loans a year. And so I think that's a huge benefit that um, could potentially, you know, help you in kind of um, calming those fears of, you know, is this going to be um, financially smart for me to extend my training even further? Other STAR benefits, um, we that um, annual NIH STAR conference that I had mentioned, um, I've had an opportunity through that conference to actually connect with other STAR scholars in other institutions. And I think it's been great because, you know, taking a year in your residency um, to pause and do dedicated research, I think not 
everyone does that. Obviously, very few people do that. And it's been a great opportunity to connect with other residents who are doing that, um, to talk about, you know, what our own experiences are and to kind of rely on each other um, uh, when you, you know, kind of are off cycle from your co-residents that you've gotten to know so well. Um, you know, additionally, obviously this year with COVID-19, a lot of labs have kind of slowed down on their research, the opportunities to publish um, and, and be productive um, has slowed down. And so I think um, that kind of makes this program pretty timely in terms of, you know, if you're looking to then uh, apply for fellowship, um, really getting, um, you know, some papers out there. And then um, additionally, you know, one to two years of greater flexibility during residency. Um, if, for example, you um, uh, have a partner that you're trying to align, you know, with in terms of training, you know, you extending a year would be beneficial for both of you or other, you know, personal or life circumstances where, um, you know, you could use some greater flexibility. I know, you know, the next five years of training for me are going to be very time consuming. So this year has really been a breath of fresh air and an opportunity to um, be flexible and have time, which that really wasn't available, you know, during residency and then on to fellowship before. Um, this is busy, but it's just to give you an example of what your year might potentially look like. Um, and so I mentioned, you know, your 20% clinical time, um, at least as of now, is solely going to be your continuity clinic. So when I first started off in July, I was in clinic, you know, had some orientation to my lab, um, training on the lab techniques I would be doing, um, did my experiments, data collection through September or October. November, I had my clinic again, um, you know, had some kind of uh, short coursework in immunology that supplement my background knowledge for my project. Um, you know, going into January and February, I'm going to be doing more data analysis and experiments, um, some formal coursework in biostatistics, um, some abstract submission deadlines are going to be, you know, in December and February. I'll have another clinic month in March and then, you know, continue to work on my manuscript in addition to other papers that my mentor has, you know, asked me to um, contribute to and even um, write as first author. Um, and then, you know, in June is kind of um, conference uh, season. So to be honest, the year has already flown by um, and I'm making a lot of progress on my project, but also um, it, you know, time is just flying by. So, you know, kind of towards the end of your um, first year as a STAR um, scholar, you have the opportunity to decide if you'd like to, you know, apply for an additional year um, of research. And, um, you know, already I'm trying to um, make that decision for myself, um, if that's something that I would like to do. And I can see, you know, the numerous reasons why that would be beneficial for, you know, my career and the projects that I have going on. Um, I just wanted to give an example of the project that I'm working on um, to, you know, give you a concrete um, look at, at what a project could look like. So I'm evaluating the um, inflammatory response during ARDS in um, the lungs of COVID-19 um, patients. So kind of the short of that is, you know, we know that there's certain um, patients, I you know, whether they're old, obese, have diabetes, you know, predisposing conditions that um, predispose them to doing worse with COVID and, and developing ARDS. But there's also this idea of a cytokine storm um, that can, you know, pre to, uh, precipitate um, poor outcomes and even in healthy adults. And so um, what's known so far about that cytokine storm is really gleaned off of, um, what's been measured in the plasma. And not a lot of, um, you know, groups are looking at the lungs themselves and what the inflammatory response is in the lungs, because not a lot of people want to do BALs on patients for research because it's very aerosolizing and they, you know, want to protect themselves. And so what um, our, my lab is 
doing at National Jewish Health um, under Dr. Kara Mould and um, Dr. Bill Jansen is looking at the, you know, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid of critically ill patients um, with ARDS from COVID and examining the cytokines and also the, um, you know, immune cell populations and how those change in the lung compared to the blood over the course of um, ARDS and their illness. Um, and so I've had an opportunity to learn a bunch of different lab techniques, including ELISA's, um, cytospins, flow cytometry. Um, I'll be you know, doing a lot of work with our biostatisticians and learning a lot about biostatistics myself. And then um, you know, a lot about manuscript uh, preparation. Throughout my time during um, research, I'm, I've been also um, participating in a weekly um, pulmonary research in progress um, meeting. Um, I, uh, you know, watch weekly pulmonary ground rounds. We have weekly lab meetings. Um, so there's a lot of kind of other supplemental um, meetings and opportunities to see what other research is out there and also be involved in, you know, what specialty that you're pursuing. I know this year I've become really integrated in the pulmonary department just through my own um, mentors and then participating in these um, meetings. Um, I uh, have a couple abstract submission deadlines coming up through the ATS and then also the Aspen Lung Conference. And then um, already, you know, my mentor has expressed to me that I will be first author on um, the manuscript that I'm preparing for my main project. And she's also um, mentioned um, several, and we've talked about several other papers that can kind of um, stem off of my current major project that I could be working on um, later on in the year that have potential for first author as well. Um, and this is just an example of um, the milestones that are um, expected of a um, you know resident investigator through the STAR program. Um, kind of in the you know this time now that you guys are considering you know to apply, you know selecting your mentor and project the application and then um, acceptance into the program. And then, you know, in your first year, you initiate your research, you select a mentorship team, you um, usually, you know, meet weekly with your mentor. And then you, uh, for me, my mentor and my quote unquote coach um, is the same person, Dr. Kara Mould. And so she's my coach in terms of um, career development and, um, uh, talking about what, you know, a career in, in research is. Um, you meet semi-annually with your mentorship team, again, to discuss your project and other career development. And then um, kind of in your first year throughout the year, um, abstract presentations at conferences, preparation of your manuscript. And then, and, um, like I mentioned at the end, you kind of um, consider whether or not you'd like to extend your R38 training. Um, if you guys haven't already looked at it, this is just a brief, you know, um, outline of what the application looks like. You'll have a pro your project description, um, your research plan, which is really the meat of your application, um, where you list your aims. Um, you talk about the background, why your project is um, going to contribute to um, current what's currently known, and your methods. Um, you know, methods I think my mentor really helped me out with in terms of, um, you know, discussing what um, lab techniques we're going to be using, how the samples were um, obtained um, and whatnot. So that's something I think you can work with your mentor with really closely. Um, and then you have um, kind of several paragraphs and or, you know, one to a few paragraphs discuss, discussing each of these topics or goals, what you expect to publish with your scholarly work, milestones, again, something that your mentor can help you with, um, how your um, research year will help with the core competencies that have been, you know, um, emphasized in your residency training, and then um, uh, a little bit about how this year will contribute to your professional and your personal development, 
Um, your mentor uh, will need to submit uh, you know, an NIH style bio sketch and then you'll um, submit one as well. There's online examples of, of what that bio sketch might look like. Yeah, you should ask your mentor for a letter of commitment, basically just you know, supporting that um, you know, they're happy to have you in their lab or in their research group and um, that they're willing to support you through this year. And then two letters of support. Um, I used um, my um, APD and then also a previous uh, research mentor that I had. Um, so, you know, basically, I think the STAR program program is um, an incredible opportunity that not everyone gets during residency. It's really an opportunity for you to um, immerse yourself in um, research, determine whether a career as a physician scientist is really going to be um, fitting for you. And I think um, on top of that, you're just going to be a stellar applicant into whatever fellowship um, you decide to pursue, if you decide to pursue fellowship. Um, and and then uh, just as a reminder that the deadline is December 15th and then you can reach out to any of your program directors for um, any additional questions or support and then also um, reach out to me I'm super happy to answer any questions and then Dr. Schwartz um, said he'd be available as well so um, let us know if you guys have in, any questions at all I have a quick one or I don't know a couple I guess um, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure this is a, a question for you, Jace, or for uh, Dr. Schwartz. But Jace, I know your research is pretty bench heavy. Um, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're in there pipetting and analyzing these mini BALs. Um, is that sort of scholarship preferred by, um, by the program or is there a role for sort of more clinically focused research? So, um, great question. Uh, we support all types of research as long as it focuses on heart, lung, or blood disease. <clears throat> so, we, uh, you know, if you wanted to do health services research focusing on heart, lung, lung and blood disease, we're 100% we're, we're supportive of that. If you want to do clinical research, 100% supportive of that. Um, and, you know, I, I, think, I think what we are going to be doing when we evaluate your applications if you apply to the program is try to get a sense of well is the proposal consistent with the expertise of the mentors and will that really accelerate the development of a, of a candidate um, not a specific type of research yeah. makes sense you had other questions um, I was interested in uh, the process you mentioned a couple times selecting your mentorship committee um, and I know your your chief research mentor and your coach are the same person but I was wondering how many other people make up that committee and how you go about choosing them and kind of what role they they perform for you and then I'll stop asking questions okay, sure, sure I'll yeah, I'll, I'll talk about how I chose mine. So mine is um, Dr. Mould, who's my main um, kind of research mentor, and then uh, Bill Jansen, who were under his like kind of overarching lab. And then I additionally, I have Sunita Sharma, who is an MD. She does um, a lot of work with asthma, but um, basically what I did for my research uh, mentorship committee was I asked, you know, Dr. Mould, because I'm new to, you know, this um, world of ARDS and the research or the lab techniques that we're using. And so she, you know, made recommendations of certain people that um, would be useful to reach out to um, based on the lab techniques that we're using. So I, I also have Sunita Sharma, who does a lot of work with asthma, but does um, kind of similar work with her uh, lab research. And then also Esther Vlader, who's an, a PhD, but again, familiar with the techniques that we use. So um, she does a lot of uh, more work with kind of like the um, epithelial cells within the airway. And so it's kind of adjacent, um, you know, fields within pulmonary itself, but would be able to contribute to, um, you know, how my research is being conducted or um, make suggestions on, you know, how I can um, go on with my project. 
So a research committee is sort of like a thesis committee. It's built uh, on that same concept. And uh, those committees do three things. Um, the first thing they do is they make sure that your research is on track. In other words, you're asking a good question and you're pursuing it with state-of-the-art work. And then when you run into hurdles, they help you figure out how to get over or around those hurdles. So it's specific about research. That's the, that's the first thing they do. The second thing they do is they make sure that the research that you're doing fits into a bigger view of sort of your career development plan. How does that, how is that working for you and how can they help you take that next step in your career? So it's a very, very supportive group of individuals, but it's a very critical uh, group of individuals at the same time. Um, I've served on a lot of those committees and it's one of the most favorite things I, I do during the day because, you know, you're really helping them think through the science and you're also helping them think through how that science fits into their life. And the third thing that a research committee does is it just serves as sort of um, an outside test of reality. You know, like sometimes, sometimes you get so like tunnel vision about something that you're not sure how it fits into the broader context of the world. And the research committee helps you plug into the rest of the world. In a, in, a, in a very positive way. I think the research committees uh, are important. I, I want to give you one, one insight that I have into the R38. Um, and um, I think it's important for all of you to consider. Um, <clears throat> when, when I trained in terms of my research, in terms of my clinical and research training, after medical school, I had my normal three years of residency. And back then we only had to do one year of clinical fellowship. So I had four clinical years. It took me five research years to feel comfortable to do, to apply for a bona fide job as a physician scientist. Now, I'm not saying that you should like commit to all five years, but like any relationship, this allows you to commit to one year without the commitment to the other four years. It takes four or five years to be a really uh, uh, competitive faculty member in terms of a physician scientist. Think about your clinical training. You went to medical school for four years. You're doing residency for three or four years. You're doing fellowship for another year or so. You've got about eight years of clinical training. Why not say that, you know, I mean, research will take the same amount of time, but this, the R38 gives you an opportunity to do one solid year of research without committing to the other four and figuring out whether that's good for you or not and whether that makes sense to commit to the remaining uh, time and research that that it takes everyone to do. Everyone thinks they can just do it in a year or two. You can't, um, or you can, but you, you'll, you'll never become an independent funded investigator. You really need to put in the time and effort to, um, to be able to um, have the ability to um, go after things that you wanna study and go after them aggressively and confidently and uh, making sure that you're using state-of-the-art approaches to looking at them. So the R38 in my mind is, is sort of like a no-brainer for someone who's thinking about being a physician scientist. It's almost like a no-brainer because you, you get to test the waters without committing to that five years of research. Um, and uh, and you, and you get the loan repayment program at the same time. It's, it's, um, it's a really simple, from my perspective, a really simple decision if, you want, if you're interested in becoming a physician scientist. So um, what other questions do you have? I don't, mean to, I don't mean to diminish the importance of the decision. I really don't. And, and I'm sure you're struggling with you know, pros and cons related to this. 
Um, but I do think it's a way of, of really getting, I mean, you know, there is one medical student who's working in my lab full time for a year uh, doing research. He decided to take a year out of medical school. And I'm gonna encourage him to take a year out of residency and encourage him to take a year out of fellowship because I, I really do believe that that's the, way to, um, that's the way to get some solid research training without it being a grind, without it um, um, being too much of a commitment. Sorry if you guys addressed this while I was gone. Um, I'm curious about like the, how well projects typically fit in the bubble of say heart, lung, and blood. So say when someone is interested in immunology, um, could that fit under blood or does it have to be strictly hematology research? It, so I would encourage you to talk specifically with me about your project. Um, just, you know, you can give me a high level of what it is and I'm happy to, I mean, we could either talk after this call or um, at another time, but um, the answer to your question is I'm going to do everything I can to make it as flexible as possible for you to qualify. Awesome. Thank you. I, yeah. And I can say, you know, for my project particularly, it's very immunology heavy. Um, you know, it has to do with ARDS and that's, you know, lung specific, but um, I mean, we are macrophage, we're a macrophage lab and I'm, you know, measuring cytokines and um, so it's very immunology heavy. Thanks guys. I have a quick question about the clinical time. Um, when, if um, someone was to be accepted, how flexible is kind of designing that, putting that into the year and is there a potential to not do just continuity clinic if you wanted to do a little bit of time in like the NICU or the PICU or another place? Great question. Yeah, you can. Um, it's um, it's going to be residency dependent. And I can tell you that I have worked really closely with each of the residency directors to develop a trusting relationship so that we create a flexible program. So um, I, you know, I, I think we're gonna um, be able to accommodate individual uh, interests. We want to accommodate individual interests. You know, part of succeeding as a physician scientist really is to become somewhat unique. Um, and to develop unique science and develop a unique niche for yourself. So we want, you know, that's part of what we want you to do. And, and so I would say if you want to take it from the perspective of I want to develop a unique clinical niche for myself during this year also, I don't see why we couldn't accommodate that. Awesome. Thanks. I should tell you, this program is heavily supported by the Department of Medicine and the Department of Pediatrics. So, uh, um, you know, I'm the chair of medicine. We put in $50,000 a year into the program in addition to what the NIH puts in. Steve Daniels puts in $50,000 a year into the program in addition to what the NIH puts in. And we're, we're, we're all in, we're really committed to the program. In fact, I convinced the dean to extend this beyond medicine and pediatrics. And in a couple of years, we'll be offering it to surgery and to OBGYN and a variety of other departments. Any other questions, guys? I just had a question on your process, Jace. When was it, was your process like, I, I know I want to do this program, so I'm going to, I'm going to develop an idea and a, an idea for a project. Then I'm going to go look for a mentor who can like help me make that happen. Or was it more like, I know I want to do research. So I'm going to go find a mentor whose research excites me. And then together we will, and then together we'll go after this R38 business and, and try to make a go of it. It was more so the latter. 
first. So, you know, I was um, basically for a number of reasons, you know, interested in doing the R38 as a research year and um, Dr. Connors and then my APD, uh, Lisa Davis were really the main drivers in, you know, helping me to um, apply. And what I basically did was these are my research interests. Do you know what anyone in, you know, these fields who are good mentors and you know, have, you know, potential to uh, mentor a resident. And I think, you know, not only is it super important for you to find a topic or project that you're going to be really interested in, but to find a, an amazing mentor, because, you know, there can be a lot of um, uh, potential mentors out there that, you know, um, are willing to to help you, but don't have quite the, you know, um, bandwidth or the resource Courses or um, you know whatnot to to really kind of help you succeed and so I think it's really about finding the right fit of um, a project that um, can be really productive in in a year which is you know in and of itself a huge feat um, and then also a great mentor who um, has potentially mentored people in the past you know has experience doing that um, so you know basically I came to them with these are my research interests. I want to do this program. And they, you know, came up with a short list of potential people I should talk to. And um, just, you know, talking with, you know, several different um, labs um, and PIs who were all great. You know, I found uh, my current project now. That's the best way to, at your stage, that's the best way to do it. It would be, um, it, it would be, um, a bit unrealistic for you to come up with a fundable project of your own. And I don't expect you to do that. Um, Thank what God. I, what I expect you to do is to tell me or one of the other, um, or one of the program directors or one of the other PIs, hey, I'm interested in this area of clinical work. I'd like to, this, this clinical problem, I'd like to be able to explore it on either a clinical, basic, or translational level. Who should I talk with? Um, and then we can make the introductions from there. Okay, good. So let me ask, um, you know, the 15th is, is soon. I think it's just eight days away. And um, the question is, have any of you contacted PIs and are set in terms of projects and things like that? Ellie, you are? Good. Yeah, I, I will be applying. <laughs> okay, and who are you gonna work with? Um, I'm working with Erica Mandel, who's the primary PI, and then, so with Steve Abman and then, um, Brad Smith, who's a bioengineer, will help as well. Yeah, cool. Good. Great. I'm excited. It'll be cool. Yeah. I spent a month in their lab, um, my first month of second year. So. Okay, good. That's great. Well, I mean, that, that's great because it creates a lot of continuity for you. Mm -hmm. What about you, Isabel? I am an intern, so I have another year to think about this. It's mostly just curious. Okay, good. And is it August or Augie or? I, my, my folks call me Gus. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm also an intern. And so uh, just uh, research, research curious. Uh -huh. So interns can uh, do this. You, know, you understand that um, if you apply now, we could start you after your internship year july 1st um, we are also going to have another solicitation in the spring so you can apply in the spring if if you want um, and it sounds like you might need that time to you know get in touch with the pi and and set up a project um, um, i would you know i would I'd at least look, you know, even if you're not committed to applying for the STAR, 
I'd at least start talking to a few people and say, you know, hey, I'm interested in this area of research. Who should I talk with? And um, it, it, it shouldn't take you that long to talk to two or three people to figure out whether it makes sense or not for you. Um, so anyway. That's my yeah, opinion. I think that makes sense. My my understanding, I thought that it, it wasn't available for interns. That's that's very exciting to know. No, it is available. It's actually we're going to start using it as a recruitment a tool, so you can come in as an intern and start research. That would be an unusual person, you know, because they'd have to have everything in place. But um, if they did, we want to be able to offer that. I, I think that it, it's already an effective uh, recruitment tool. It's definitely one of the reasons that uh, my, my wife is also in the program as an MD, PhD doing the PSDP program. But it was, uh, it was a huge draw for both of us because it meant that our time at Colorado might line up better. So it's, I think it's a, already an, an effective recruitment instrument. Great, good, good. Um, okay, um, other questions? Okay. Mr. Comment, thank you so much for taking time to present this information and answer questions. Yeah, Jace, Jace pulled it all together herself. This was her idea, not mine. And I think, you know, that is going to be emblematic of how I run this program is um, that uh, I'm going to um, really be quite um, responsive to what the trainees need and want, certainly within bounds, but, but I think um, the idea really will be, um, I want the trainees to receive rigorous scientific training that allows them to help figure out what the next steps in their career are gonna be. And um, there's a great opportunity to support several people each year. And, you know, as I said, the Dean has, provided me more funds to be able to expand this uh, in, in future years. So um, it, it'll be a group of five to 10 people that are doing research, which is gonna be very exciting. Yeah, I mean, I can't emphasize enough how um, I think beneficial it's been for my career, for being able to spend dedicated time really, you know, seeing what a career as a physician scientist would be like. Um, I think, you know, applying to fellowships is gonna be um, much a nicer experience for me. Um, and then also, I, you know, just the flexibility of this year um, in the middle of residency has been incredible. Um, I think I'm gonna go into my real R2 year, just, you know, completely, um, energized and you know ready to continue my training um and you know i can't speak enough about how um this program is going to be like helping me like professionally and personally and then also you guys if you are applying and then need any help whatsoever would like me to look over you know applications or have any questions just feel free to reach out i'm totally available you know, one thing that was a lot of fun for me um, was, first of all, getting to know Jace and hearing what she wants to do in terms of her career um, and, and seeing what it's done for her. Um, but then uh, having that national conference that we had about a month and a half ago was a real boost um, in terms of, hey, this program is, is a reality and there are a lot of people that are very excited about it. and. Uh, and there are a lot of people that are doing incredibly great things. They had some of the trainees present their research and it was so much fun to hear what these folks are doing. Uh, and it becomes a community that you end up bonding with and hopefully we'll be able to have an in-person national meeting next year. So anyway. I don't want to keep you on the phone too long, and um, I don't know how to deal with this recording. Uh, so someone's going to have to tell me, do I just stop the recording? And does it then come to me as an email or something?
You know, I'm not sure how that works. Does anyone else know? Okay. I'm gonna. I'll figure it out. I'll figure okay. it out. Let's go.